right, how's it going, guys? Welcome to uh, this Apex community webcast. Um, I'm Pfizer FPV. I'm joined by Asylum FPV, and this week we have a special guest with us, all the way from Apex Drone Racing team. We've got Glenn Bales in the house, which is uh, an honour. Hey. So it's good to see you, dude. How's it going? I'm good. How are you guys? Not bad. Good, Not bad. good. Definitely. Um. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic to have our first ever official guest on the on the web webcast like, this is yeah it's gonna be great so strap in guys we're gonna delve into the world of apex drone racing from the team manager slash technical director glenn bales it's gonna be cool all right so for those who don't know glenn um where you're from how long you've been flying and how did you come up with swinglish fpv always the most <laughs> common questions yeah yeah no so um i'm from sweden so i live in a town like southwest southwestern parts i'd say um i've been flying for probably four or five years at this point i think um right. started off yeah sometime when i was studying and uh yeah i've been doing it ever since and now uh when it comes to my fpv name i'm half swedish half british so uh, i usually have a tendency to talk swinglish so uh, <laughs> mixed up and therefore that's my name <laughs> my nickname cool thought it might be the case but you know for those out there that didn't quite get it yeah now we know um so did you start with i know a lot of people started off with the dji route and then got into freestyle fpv and then into racing was that the natural progression for you also um no actually i i started off buying a micro like a really small okay. one um it wasn't a hubson it was almost like a hubson clone um, just with my friends, we, we just were flying in in the lecture halls during uh, or between uh, um, lectures, and then uh, I got hooked. They stopped, so I uh, bought my first. Well, it was just an FPV drone. Um, when I was starting it, racing hadn't really kicked off that much yet, so it was just more getting up in the air and trying to be able to fly and control it properly. Just keep it there and, and keep zipping around, type of thing. I know exactly. Yeah, with the yeah. Big box goggles on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I, I had the uh, what, what we call the ghetto goggles from uh, yeah. Hobby King, um, yeah. the quantum FPV stuff. Uh, and and for the guys who've been flying almost as long as I have, I was flying uh, pre. I think it was pre one shot days. So I was flying. Uh, wow. Um, non. Uh, I didn't have active braking. Or anything. Oh, I also didn't have air mode. Uh, I was flying uh, open pilot on a CC3D, I think it was. So it was. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, he, he definitely knew if you were flying straight away. You, it was like you're either going to crash the thing or keep it in the air. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It was do or die from the very get go. Yeah, and the polycarbonate props as well. Six inch yes. polycarbonate on 22 or four oh. motors. 3S. <laughs> I, I remember straight actually off the like. When I when I first got into it, I was I was kind of lucky because everything has advanced to a point now where it's kind of easy to do a lot of stuff, like especially in terms of the wiring, electronics, and things. And I'm I'm looking back at things even as far as a, a year or so ago where people are, mm. I mean people still do they use the, the the four individual ESCs, and I'm like, how how on earth like I mean it it must have been so, it, it must have been a real difficult task to take technology that wasn't really designed necessarily for, for drones and quadcopters and kind of implement that into a frame and, and get these things in the sky. I mean, if things went wrong and stuff, I mean, how did your kind of technical knowledge play into that? Uh, well, at that point, I had studied engineering for, I think it was like just over or just under a year almost. So I, I basically didn't have any technical knowledge. Um, and I, I studied me mechanical engineering, so my electronic knowledge was uh, zero, almost zero, basically. So it was just a learning process. I, I remember flying and then suddenly my drone didn't work. That's because I had like six or seven different cold soda joints as well. So it was just oh, no. randomly vibrating loose. <laughs> it, was, it was really horrible. I still have the quad somewhere in my um, wardrobe. Tucked away, so I think we all keep our first quads, don't we? I know I've, I had yeah. A, yeah. It was a Mobulus Seven, I think was the first one I had, and it's absolutely destroyed. But it's still somewhere because it's <laughs> you just feel that connection to it. It's like I've got to keep it. Exactly. And, and every now and again, you actually take it out too, and you just like, no, this is, and you're like, oh my god, how how far have we actually come from this, and how much have I learned from this 
one little creature, you know, this mm. one little drone. And it's just like, even in the last 18 months, the amount of technology and things that have moved to such a rapid pace. Like, as you say, we've yeah. gone from four four, in, uh, four individual ESCs to four in ones are the common. And it's just crazy now, you know, especially even when you start looking at DJI and everything else that goes into it. It's just the evolution's been nuts. Yeah. And now, with, when you got into racing, Glenn, I noticed that you designed your own frame. How did you come into that? Did there Was there nothing, was it just an opportunity that came along or was it something that you thought, no, nah, I could do something better with this or how did that come about? Um, yeah, so when it came to developing my own frame, it's a box style frame, frame if people haven't hmm. seen it. Hang on, I can actually get it. It just ha It's just hanging on the wall here. It was on the wall. <laughs> it is, yeah, exactly. So it's this type of frame right here. Um, and it's box style. Um, it was my one of my friends, actually, um, who, who, who'd been flying box style for, I think, a long, long time, like four or five years. And uh, he wasn't really happy with the design as it was. It was a bit heavy, because it's quite hard to get a, a box style frame that's both um, light, has a good center of gravity, but not being a top mount. Um, so that's what I wanted to design. Um, and uh, so yeah, so I, me and him, we set out the like basic parameters of it, and then I designed it. And uh, yeah, I've been flying it for about three years now. Nice. And it's still competitive. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I still really like it. It's getting a little bit towards the heavy side. I think it's 82 grams without with. Um, with uh, the motor screws and everything. Okay. Um, but yeah, well, that's it's still, that's still, still pretty good. competitive, even even compared to some of the other frames that are coming out now. Like you see, uh, HDLRC have got the light frame and, and the Atom, the Atom, yeah, the Atom and the you know three uh, five three threes. Those frames are still roughly around that weight. So yeah. to have that frame for a couple of years now, that's that's really good. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, I think the the weight without a battery ends up around 300, 310 grams, depending on how you build it. So mm. it's 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 pretty okay. Um, but yeah, no, so I, I really like it. I really like the box style frame, how it flies. It has some really unique um, properties that you kind of have to fl fly to realize how it is, actually. Yeah, because I saw a, I've seen a lot of people that they're putting their extra arms on their, you know. Um on their five three threes and, and their switchbacks and stuff like that and i'm like okay what is that kind of i i don't actually i get it but not in practical sense only because i'm not racing mm. but everyone's like nah it gives you that extra strength that extra rigidity and the extra protection from slamming it into things but yeah i, th I think until you actually own those type of frames and fly them competitively you actually it makes sense so yeah but you've got to get you gotta know what works and what runs for you to a certain yeah. degree so yeah, yeah no I, I think what's what's interesting about the box frame is it um, not just that it's like it looks maybe a little bit more aer aerodynamic but it is the stiffness that really makes a difference mm. um, you can uh, it like it it's really surprising at least a couple of years ago when we no noticed this is the fact that it when a frame becomes so stiff which it do it does with a box frame um, mm. the frame resonances get pushed up so high so you can actually filter a lot less and then you reduce the latency for the control loop which will um, which will help with the responsiveness a ton so yeah. i think that's one of the big ones why it flies so good and then it's i think it also has something to do with the the ratio of um what is the term in English of drag, uh, like the front yep. drag um, mm. compared to the side drag? Um, the the ratio is quite a lot larger compared with flat flat arms, I think, and that's why it usually feels more locked in when you're doing more sweeping type of turns. It's kind of like an aeroplane wing in a way. I think that 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 minimal aerodynamic resistance on a, a large surface versus a thin mm. surface, um, but also as you're carving through the air. You get almost—it's almost like a like a rudder, I guess. The way that the air kind of helps to to keep you on track, and it's that I've heard people say it's kind of like it's a lot more like flying as if you're on rails rather than just yeah. kind of floating through mm -hmm. the air. Yeah, it is definitely like that. Uh, I, I so I really like it. Uh, the downside is it's not as stiff in the yaw axis, at least mm -hmm. the design I have. Uh, so you have issues with frame resonance there. Uh, so Flight One doesn't really play nicely with box frames. 
because of that fact they're a bit sensitive to your noise um, and then um, it's it's not as durable and easy to work with as maybe uh, a frame that would weigh the same and be uh, just have like regular arms but yeah it's it's all a trade-off but I, I really like this frame so flight's nice so flight one flight one for Glenn he's he's all over flight one by the sound of it so <laughs> I'm I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm more open source guy um, I, I open like source. Looking at data yeah so. hmm. That's my nice type of stuff. Yeah, definitely like the data because at least in that way you can turn around and, and go, all right, well, this is where it's actually, you can go into the black box and say, right, this is where it's it's tweaking. This is where I can pull it back out. There's, yeah, I'm a bit the same. <laughs> um, so I noticed on Eric, um, one of Eric's posts that he was actually having up that you were designing tracks in Velocidrone and were you, Designing tracks in real life, also. Um, yeah, I I kind of liked designing tracks uh, to fly on, uh, fly in. You see, oh, never mind. Anyways, yeah, no, I, I like just um, doing that a lot. I've been, see, I I practice a lot on my own, and I'm I usually like just having tracks that actually are well thought out. And also, I've been quite active in the uh, Swedish racing uh, scene. Uh, so we have a cup in Sweden, which is called the Swedish Drone Cup, where we have 10 competitions each year. And I've been uh, active on that board as well. And I, I usually uh, um, like to design a couple of tracks here uh, through that, which is fun. So and what's your favorite obstacle? What is one thing that, that you like putting in and watching people squirm? <laughs> but you yourself either nail or you don't like yourself. It's like, I'm not flying this track. I'm going to design it. I'm going to put one thing in there that's going to trip everyone up. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm actually a big fan of uh, less is more when it comes to racing. Uh, for, for me, for me, it's about trying to uh, fly against the different pilots instead of trying to conquer the track. And usually yep. having a more flowy track with maybe some like technical tempo switches um, is is what I like. And it's it's at least for me conducive to good racing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely it's good. Nice. For, uh... It's good to have sections of track where you can really feel like you can let loose. Um, there's nothing worse I find than than you kind of set yourself a track up and you go, oh yeah, I'm going to put a loop in, I'll put in some some ladder gates and some other stuff and then you fly it and you realize that really you're kind of you're spending so much time kind of up and down on the throttle <clears throat> that you don't really get a chance to <clears throat> get into that headspace and feel like you're consistently locked in on every lap because you're spending so much time thinking about i got to enter this backwards to come out here and you spend too much time evaluating it i think you're right i think having a flowy track is much more conducive to a a happy mindset as you're flying it. Um, it it doesn't necessarily take less time to get good at that track because I think when you're dealing with a flowy track it's more about shaving those tiny little tenths of a second off you know apexing the corner just perfectly or finding the right way to enter things so it's still it's still technical in its own way um, but I think I agree with you I think I, I much prefer having a nice flowy track with those elements that you kind of where you do this, like you say, it's a tempo change just to kind of switch things up. I think you're right. Yeah, and it's it's funny we should talk about those type of tracks because both of the tracks this week in DCL, the Sandbox and the um, Gnarly, are, are two different. They're chalk and cheese. You know, um, the Sandbox was, was quite flowy with a couple of technical in, um, parts, but then all of a sudden you've got what they're calling the Gnarly track, which that was just a mind bend that was a mind bend so but yeah. it shows like i'm out of here i'm not yeah. talking about that track that, I, that's I killed noped, me all week i noped off of that track yeah. within a day i was like hey, that's as fast uh, as i'm going no uh, yeah it's it's been yeah it's been a head, head case and a half i was gonna say something else there but we'll leave that one out <laughs> um glenn yeah um do you prefer personally going out and racing or did the cinematic freestyle type of stuff is more of your relaxing type of time or flying's flying, you don't care as long as you're ripping packs? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm more of a racer. I'm a very competitive guy. So as soon as I started flying, it was um, even before I knew any other people who were flying in Sweden, it was just, oh, how can I do this faster? Okay, now I'm doing these ovals. Okay, how can I go faster? So it's <laughs> that's always been the goal for me to race. 
Um, so I'm more of a racer. Sometimes I do cinematic stuff, but it's usually uh, just focused on racing. Like 80% of the time at least. <laughs> at least 80% of the time. Because some of the other team members from Apex, you see him out doing more cinematic or, you know, even with Eric, he's, he's gone out and, all right, the season's over, I'm going to do some freestyle and play with that. So, yeah, we everybody has their go-to, whether it's just riffing packs, it doesn't matter what, or, yeah, their mind focus is one or the other. So, cool. All right. Um, let's get into... I'm just throwing stuff around. Um, let's get into DCL. Um how did you actually become the team manager technical director of apex drone racing um i think it was basically me just knowing some of the guys who were on the team so um i've been um, competing uh or with or against um both dane eric and uh oscar nilsson who was on the team before as well um and also noah Koch, who was um who's also been previously on the team so, um, so yeah, so I, I knew them quite well from before. And I've, uh, I was offering to give some help. So I was in the background helping them, giving them some feedback on how the actual uh, frame looked like and stuff like that. And then uh, after a while, uh, I think it was Dane who recommended me to Christian. And uh, or Christian, who's the team owner, I guess, and CEO of Apex. Yeah. And uh, he asked if I wanted to be on board a bit more officially and I said yeah sure that sounds like fun and that was sometime I think it was the summer last year actually so it wasn't that long ago yep and uh, I've been uh, on the team ever since because that would have been that would have been right at the start of the 2019 in real life um, races and that would have been an experience traveling around with the team yeah, you know, watching yeah. the crowds and, and, and trying to absorb all that so quickly because you kind of the way I saw it you, you kind of became the face of Apex drone racing to a certain degree yeah. with the interviews with DCL and, and, and everything else that kept popping up. And even this year with um, with the sim, you all the interviews and everything else, it was like, who is this guy? You know, he's, he's not flying. He's the team manager and he's always commenting for, for Apex. So, but that would have been pretty full on, you know, because you would have gone, okay, well, I'm here. I'm helping the boys out. And now all of a sudden there's cameras in your face going, <laughs> hey, what about this? What about that? You know, how did you cope with all that? Or did they kind of give you a bit of a brief on it and said, look, this kind of is going to be part of the role. So expect it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've been watching DCL quite a lot before. So I knew kind of how the show was run, I think. And uh, for me, it was, it, it was, no one really told me like, yeah, there will be a lot of cameras. I, I think I just went with the flow. Uh, yeah. I don't really put too much effort into it i i know that <laughs> like it's i'm as a person i'm not a not that good in front of the camera naturally so i just figured yeah i'll just roll with it and see where it goes and just try and become slightly less awkward <laughs> the longer the time <laughs> goes basically um uh, so yeah no for me for me the main focus was just the racing and then i just took the camera stuff um in the stride as much as i could not focusing too much on that i reckon you did a pretty good job with all that because it mm -hmm. it you always were on point, which made me kind of wonder, you know, with DCL coming to you with a bit of a, a storyboard or a plan and going, all right, this is what we're going to talk about. You've got five minutes to prep it. Or was it, as you say, just totally off the cuff? Yeah, it was. it's mainly off the cuff. Uh, the guy behind the scenes who's doing the interviews, Jonathan Legard, um, he, he's also narrating some of the like recaps. Yes. He's uh, he's been involved in Formula One through B the BBC and everything. So he's he's really good at interviewing people and getting the best story out of it. So I think a big shout out to him actually for uh, guiding me in the right direction. But he just asks questions and I answer them usually in one take or maybe just try to reformulate so it became a bit more concise. But yeah. No, awesome. But it's very so, much what was that it like, kind of, um, Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> it's very no, much no, no, that no, kind okay. of Formula One style of coverage that they're trying to achieve as well. And I think that was one of the big things that they keep harking back to in the DCL commentary is how Apex are really taking that kind of Formula One slant towards the team and the management of it. Um, and, and I don't know, does it feel... I mean, it must feel significantly different to just kind of going around and touring around the country, just racing in, in different locations. 
how how different was it? Like, how big of a jump did it feel like to kind of take it from, okay, this is a, a hobby that I do at the weekend, to kind of jumping head on into what is essentially the, the Formula One of drone racing? Uh, I think for me, it became quite natural. Um, I've, I'm, I've been studying mechanical engineering, focused on product development, uh, and I've, I've, I follow I've been following Formula One now for two years, like really closely, mainly just for the engineering part. Well, you missed out so... on the good engines, Glenn. That, that was <laughs> seven or eight years ago with the V12s and the V10s. Yeah, we're in the. I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually more of a tech guy, so I, I prefer the stuff now because it's it's more engineering focused. So I'm, I'm actually. So I, I think for me it was just something that I really wanted to do, get into more of the engineering part. I've been. Uh, there's always been a community in Sweden in racing where we have some guys who are really technically minded. So we've been always discussing how to better improve the drones and so on. But we haven't really had the resources. And also when it comes to like just open spec racing, it's a bit too broad and it's a bit too easy to optimize, I think. Uh, so it becomes a lot more fun when you have a uh, more narrow type of rules that, that you have in DCL. And then it becomes more of the optimization part, and it's more tangible and easy to do uh, when you're basically just a couple of people trying to get the drone better. It's definitely it's one thing I like about the DCL racing spec is that it's it it doesn't seem like it's completely closed. Like there's enough room there to to tweak things and change parts, and you're you're kind of you are building your own drone kind of under the hood but there are specifications. It's just nice that there's, I don't know, I think Formula One, to, to use that as an example, I think can be very locked down. And I think that's a product of the fact that it's been around for so long, um, that there is a need to kind of make it competitive by locking everything down to a point where you're building inside a very small box. I, I, I like the way that DCL is going where there is a box, but it's, it's broad enough that there's a there's enough of a difference and you you can really see that between the teams when, when when you know when you guys are racing live and it is there's a lot to be said for the the kit and and obviously putting the right electronics and the right components in place i was just wondering how how you go about coming up with what parts you're going to use in in the drones yeah so when it comes to deciding what we want to use there is a there is quite a quite a narrow spec when it comes to the motors you have i think it's a maximum 2207.5 as a roof um <clears throat> and then if you go even like half a millimeter above that in stator heights you uh, you're uh, disqualified basically so 2207 is usually the maximum height and then f from that it's just it's all about trying to uh, set up what do we want to achieve in terms of performance? Where do we want to focus the performance on, and uh, and then then go from there. So it's setting a specification, a technical specification list, uh, was is what we tried to do for this year's 2020, which didn't really become a thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so we tried to go this that type of more structured route, which I've been uh, taught through um, engineering school. Does it change from race to race? So if you're, if you're going to a track, like say you're going to, I don't know, um, somewhere like Turin, where it was there was a lot of big straights um, versus one of the more technical tracks, like perhaps Vaduz, where, you know, there's a lot more kind of, it's short and snappy. Are you changing parts or are you really just changing the tune of the Pits. quad? Mm. Yeah. Um... Obviously, you don't I have think... to go into too much detail. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to yeah, give up the secrets. <laughs> no, so, so um, we're just trying to give the, in, enough information. Um, yeah, no, so it's... Without enough. <laughs> yeah. No, so I, I think last year it was a bit more off the cuff uh, since Apex, we were quite new mm -hmm. and uh, had to just like quickly make a quick design and then improve on it. So then it was just trying to optimize one part uh, and th for this year we were looking more more on how, what type of props can we use so that's quite quite a easy thing to change is uh, fine tuning the props and then also obviously changing the tune a little bit so and i think i think all teams have been looking at that like what type of motor prop combo is the best thing for this this race basically and then it's in some sense also maybe which type of battery do we want, do we want to run <clears throat> Because you have a minimum weight, you have you you're allowed to hit. So, I think it's like 
798 grams was, was what we were going to have for this year. Last year was almost 850 with everything. Yeah, wow. So they're like really heavy quads. Um, so so then it becomes and then it becomes uh, like you have to find a right balance between getting a really li a light enough but rigid enough and strong enough frame, and then uh, but you also want to have quite a lot of battery uh, so you can uh, have the power through through the whole race, and and then you you, you might be going over spec when it comes um, to weight to get gain a little bit more battery and power depending on what type of track it is like it's, it's those like smaller things that we run with we don't really have the budget to change motors and aerodynamic parts or anything like they do in formula one no wind tunnel testing then no <laughs> that would be awesome though i've been wanting to do be wind cool. tunnel testing for so long um going back to like these types of frames it, i'm really interested to see how the turbulence are from the top plate and from these things affect mm. the, the the rear motors and the rear props. Down force on the rear. Have you ever yeah, thought exactly. about maybe computational fluid dynamics, like CFD modeling, that mm. kind of thing? Does, yeah. how, how technical could you get if you wanted to, do you think? I've been discussing with people who know a lot more about CFD than me, and them basically saying, if you want to have moving propellers, with a quad moving forward like this, yeah, good luck. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Basically, th th then you need a Formula One team. Yeah, almost, it's yeah, well. it uh, it it becomes very, very quickly, very complicated, expensive, and expensive yeah. very quickly. Yeah. yeah, we need we need to Which get to the talking to the right people. That's what we need to do. I think we need to. Yeah. I, I can see you know like a, a a Red Bull kind of thing going on. I know there's a lot of the guys are doing a lot of work <laughs> with Red Bull. Maybe we just put a word in see if Christian Horner will let us use his wind tunnel. Yeah, get on to Adrian yeah. Newey. Exactly. Uh, I'll, start, I'll start drinking Red more Red Bull. Bull. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll start drinking more Red Bull just to fund it, you know. Let's, <laughs> yeah. get, let's get this going. <laughs> One can at a time. Fair enough. Uh, so, there was a massive shift this year from in, in real life to the sim. How did yourself and the team really transition that? Because we saw some epic racing over the year. Um, on the sim and I know that there was a lot of issues with the timing on when everybody was available and racing because of everyone being around the globe but at the same time going from you know tuning their tuning their quads and and getting them down and I know they had very limited time to actually get used to the new track what was it 45 minutes to get used to a new track before they raced it so how did everybody go with that and and what input did you have with them to yeah, get up to get up to pace real quick. Um, yeah, no. So what I think what we did is, uh, firstly, it, it's really interesting going into the sim world because you kind of have a, need to have a little bit of a different mindset usually compared to the real life racing. In real life racing, it's a lot more about getting a feel for the drone and the conditions quickly, just like in Formula One. And then you and then in sim racing, it's more the guys who are really good at grinding and putting in the hours. Um, but we were lucky that we had already. Uh, already had a team that had quite a lot of people who had that proclivity, maybe is the, the right word, yeah, mm. for it. Um, but when it comes to transitioning, I think uh, a lot of people had been had been doing the some sort of sim racing. There's this uh, weekly spec series in uh, Velocidrome, the, another mm. simulator called the EU spec where you have the same type of format almost. So you have 45 minutes qualifying, but then you have free practice afterwards. So I think we, we've tried to practice on that quite a lot. Um, but also I, th most, I think all the pilots have been competing in real life as well. And there you have to learn the track quickly. Uh, so, so some people were quite good at that as well. Uh, but usually what we did is before the race, we just warmed up, maybe try to fly the scenery if we could and uh, sometimes like in the beginning, like Prop Town and uh, Vados, we were able to fly those tracks that were there already to try and mm. get familiar with the, the original scenery. tracks. Yeah, exactly. But for China and for um, was it in Switzerland? Yeah. Then we yeah, the didn't one. get yeah we didn't get access to it beforehand. Oh, so wow. then we came in a bit more blind. But uh, I I think it's just a matter of trying to get used to the physics and the the game in DCL because it's quite a lot different compared to flying real life. So you need to find the nuances and learn how to fly the best there. And then we just flew 45 minutes and uh, 
yeah, I, usually I just try and let them do do their thing. But um, but I also try to I, what I do is just look to see if anyone is doing some like obvious line that they need to tweak, or if they're losing time somewhere. Some pilots want to know where they're losing time, so I'm just clicking through the different types of uh, ghost reruns to see yep. what they're doing, and then also what the competition is doing if they have found <laughs> any good lines or any uh, shortcuts. And then we, yeah, and then afterwards we usually do quite a thorough analysis of uh, if there are any lines that we should tweak uh, or anything or adopt. Yeah, mm, sure. Exactly, and also discuss um, qualifying ro- lines versus racing lines. So uh, trying to find a balance between consistency and uh, speed. Just out and out force. Yeah. So how much input during the races was there? Very much input coming from you to the guys um, over comms or was it just you're all going good you know or as little as possible just to keep them on track or you know th- with this pilot coming in behind them or you know pull that tighter was there any of that or is, by the time they're actually racing it wasn't really a great deal of input from you yeah so when it just I mean the racing heats are really short so the amount of mm. concentration that's needed is really high so um, we try to minimize the information as much as possible, but at the same time, uh, the pilots really want to know um, how how they are placed compared to everyone else. Because it's really hard when you're flying, especially in the simulator, to know where you're placed. Um, even though you have a leaderboard, um, the issue is we've had issues with latency, so it's you can't always trust, and it's also a bad thing just focusing on that when you're flying. So yeah. in, instead, <laughs> I've been we've been. Find, we've been trying to find places on the track where where I can quickly give information to them. So like your point point one point one lead or point two behind, and if someone in the other team has crashed, then I usually say they've crashed. So you have a three second lead or something. Um, yeah. But we, we've tried to iron out like these small ways and efficient ways of communicating, basically keeping it to the bare minimum that's actually required. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because there's nothing worse than turning around and, and having somebody screaming in your ear, you're going slower, hurry up, speed up, <laughs> keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> and he's he's tr- trying to do a clean line and all of a sudden you've got this noise going on in the background. It's just like, no, shut up. It's just as bad as well trying to... I, I, it impresses me when I see some of the guys on, on, on stream. I know Andreas does a lot of streaming here and there, but especially when you're in-game streaming and this, the, the guy's kind of commentating as they're flying these lines sometimes yeah. right i could barely even look away from the center of the screen if i've got like you say if i've got to look at where i am timing wise that's me i'm in the wall like I'm it's done. crazy yeah but it it's it's one of the things i know uh, i think eric has has mentioned in in interviews and things before it's the sim side of of things definitely seems to be a, a world for the younger pilots um, that, that are kind of coming up their reflexes just seem to be next level i mean we we see it certainly in 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 the uh, the kind of the, the amateur esports side of it with, with with dcl that leaderboard is populated by those young young kids coming through um all under 25 exactly it, it it's crazy it's it's absolutely mad so uh, clearly there's there's <sighs> There's a thought process around having almost like different rosters, really, for for esports and, and for real life. I, I don't know where DCL plan on taking it next year because obviously the D, the the esports was a, a massive success, really. Some of the viewership figures. Um, if if it did go that way, would would you guys maybe consider having almost like a a, a separate roster, or would you kind of try and keep it fluid to make sure that everyone's getting stick time in the real world as well as on the sims? Um, I think. We, it's definitely been a discussion between uh, me and Christian what we want to do for next year um, because if if we, when we're going racing next year it'll probably be some sort of mix between real life and uh, esports and uh, I'm pre- and we we both agree on that I think uh, we'll probably have a slightly different rosters so we'll have an esports roster and a real life roster because there are some pilots who who just do real life and some pilots who mainly just do uh, esports so we'll just try and uh, uh, yeah let them be on those rosters and then we have some pilots who are a bit more fluid um, who I think would fit quite well in both and we'll see depending on the, the load the amount of time they're able to put into practicing for just DCL we'll uh, see where where they land as well 
in it, that was, case. it was great to see that I think with with like Marcus Spunia in the last couple of uh, mm. couple of heats and rounds there like see him doing that and then the next week he's off flying in the Iberian drone league you know so it's it's yeah I mean it, it's interesting to hear you say that but I mean we see it as well I mean obviously we're in there I, I know the the elite guys have got the discord that they set up and and as, as alpha prop races we're in that and we we see some of the guys in there in, in chat and stuff and not everyone that flies incredibly well on the sim even flies in real life I mean some of these guys have just no. literally they've, they've picked it up because hey that seems like a cool game you know, it's 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 incredible the reach of it, and it, it just blows my mind that people would even play play such a niche game with without even knowing about it. Do do you find that a lot? I mean, uh, the whole draft selection process. I mean, do you find that there's a lot of guys that did just fly sim? Yeah, so I think I've uh, I, I don't I don't I haven't seen too many people who just fly sim, but I've seen a lot of people who've gotten into drone racing through the sim. So basically, mm -hmm. just flying sim a lot, and then maybe started flying real life a little bit. Uh, I, I think it's it's attractive to a lot of people who like the very competitive um, nature of uh, like the esports side, because uh, DCL the game is is quite a competitive title, I think, and it's quite difficult to master. Mm. So I think it attracts a lot of those types of people. It's um, short and uh, snappy as well. It's very quick rounds, and a lot of people do like mm. that because you you get immediate gratification. You know, it's it's kind of two minutes and it's over, and you kind of know. But it again, there's that bigger picture that kind of plays out over the course of a weekend, which which can be just fascinating. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's it's really interesting. It's it's a lot. I think it's almost a hybrid between CS:GO and like more Formula One style racing, yeah. uh, because you 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 have the short rounds of CS:GO and you have the really reflexy parts of it as mm -hmm. well. But then you have more of the racing and this racing line stress strategy part that you have in uh, more Formula One style stuff or more traditional racing stuff. So, so when it when it comes to video games, then are you more of a are you more of a sort of first person shooter kind of are you more of a CS:GO Call of Duty style guy or or do you prefer your race games? Ah, I like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Right, enough said. There's a reason yeah. why I like flowy tracks. I don't have the reflexes <laughs> for the the technical stuff. For sure. Have you got a favorite yeah. racing game? What what are you rocking at the moment? I I actually just started race racing this stuff maybe a couple months ago, so I'm just doing it F1 the game. Yeah. Uh, but I'm looking into going into some sort of um, eSport, like more um, sim stuff. Um, I, ha I have Race Room downloaded as well. So I'll, I'll start off with that and see if I go into iRacing or set a course or something. But I'll, I'm uh, more of an F1 uh, game right now. It's, yeah, it's a, a good hybrid. My, a lot of my friends are playing that at the moment. They say it's really, really good. I haven't I haven't got a setup. I used to play it all the time on, uh, on the PlayStation. But yeah. now I've kind of moved over everything to the PC. I, I don't have a setup to play it anymore, but I religiously will play those games. I think that it's just that feeling of being nailed to the ground and throwing it into a corner at 200 mile an hour. It's yeah, it's it's, it's a good it's a good game. No, I'm 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 impressed. That's 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 awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. You know, I, I've actually I realized that I, I uh, if I'd grown up in a different environment, I'd probably do more racing because I, I just discovered racing through. Um, through drone racing but I'm, i've been getting into more like go-kart stuff and so as well so i really just enjoy that part it's good for it's awesome. good for competition and i and i think it's an expensive hobby and i think that's probably yeah. why people oh, yeah. enjoy the drone racing stuff so much especially the esports because you can you can go over 100 miles an hour um mm. esports if you crash you don't even break anything but even if you're you know even if you break a drone it's 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 nice to be able to fly at those speeds feel like you're in the quad but if you do crash really you're just stood there crying over two or three hundred pounds worth of broken electronics yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's like, okay. oh, while, it's, while it's session on real in real racing with like proper cars or go-karts you'll have burned through more more money in terms of rubber than that exactly. yeah. fuel so Petrol, yeah exactly. and fuel in, in the same cost it's definitely the sport so... of the future Oh, definitely, and I, and and as you say, with all these people that have just found it for the first time mm. um, through the esports and through whatever platform they're playing it on, um, yeah, it's going to be the next couple of years is going to be amazing for both in real life and esport. I think and so. It's definitely going to be a case of watch this space. I think there's going to be people coming out of everywhere, and they're going to be uber fast. Let's be honest, because they're going to have so much time just to grind. 
and the reflexes in a lot of their 12 year old cases like come on seriously yeah we'll stick to <laughs> commentating on uh, how apex are doing uh, my aspirations for actually <laughs> flying in real life and out the window <laughs> yeah Props cost too much. Uh, not, not as much as you know, <laughs> Windows and, and and Formula One cars. Let's be well, honest. I, I built this. Obviously, um, any I'm sure oh. most of the community are well aware that with the Apex uh, canopy giveaway. So I've built this. So this is this is the next best thing for me. I can feel like I'm <laughs> flying the real thing. Nice, nice. Stop rubbing it in. Stop rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got my put... shopping cart full of parts. All right, I'm waiting. I'm coming. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, what I plan on doing because that that is a light build. Um, I only have four S packs. I don't have the money at the moment to be throwing away on six S packs. So I've done a light build. It's a four S kind of rig with the capability of upgrading when I do get some 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 packs come summer. I can't justify spending that money right now as much as I want to. <laughs> Um, whilst it's windy and rainy but what i'm going to do i'm going to try and get um, a build video up on the on the youtube channel for that at some point um just kind of running over what i've done and how i've made it work on 4s um but I'm, i kind of i'll delay that until i can actually get out and really fly it in anger because at the moment all i've tested a bit do is kind of hop it around and i know it works but it's like i want that i want that nice footage so but i, I will i'll get a i'll get a video up just to kind of uh, let people know how that how that works out because it's it's awesome. cool. It's it's nice to have. It's cool to have a, a a proper kind of racing drone like like the DCL ones. You see them on the TV all the time, and it's like it's mm -hmm. one thing flying your switchback or flying your Atta or whatever, but that canopy just makes it. It's such an iconic look. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, and thanks to Apex as well for doing that giveaway. That was that was uh, really unexpected and, and really cool. Yeah, no, yeah, that was, that was an awesome our, giveaway. Our pleasure. It's it, I think it's it's fun to be able to give back to some other fans. So. Yeah. Absolutely. No, but flying those so, drones is just so different. Oh god, it's so hard. I think <laughs> I, I, have, I have mine right there, uh, and a couple more. I've been, I've been test flying them quite a lot. It's just such a different thing. They're so heavy. It's crazy the amount of uh, momentum you carry through corners. So it's it's fun because when because I, I, um, I. When I was when you were watching like DCL, just when they've been racing, they they just look like they're like in the beginning you just think that they're bad pilots because of the fact that it just <laughs> looks so clumsy, and but then then when you see people like Minchan and so on fly there as well and it looks almost the same, I, I started realizing oh they might, might just be hard to to find. <laughs> then I got my hands on them. I was like oh holy shit, how do you even fly this? <laughs> it's well, that's crazy you, how I, difficult it was. I think one of the first races I tuned into live. I, I, I've been watching since like, year, for years now, but it's only really the last couple of years that I've, I've been watching the live ones. I remember tuning in to Turin and the amount of drones in the water. I was I, I couldn't yeah. watch. Like there was heats, and they, you'd get like five out of the eight. Oh god, what the heck, man! That's so much money. These guys going out in the boats, kind of fishing them out, scooping them back <laughs> out. So bad. Yeah, we we got a couple of those back from that race. Was... You did? Did they did they work? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> no, we, I, th I think we we put 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 away those parts for a rainy day to see if they worked. But yeah, luckily they wall hangers. Yeah, yeah, luckily we didn't need to use them. <laughs> it's the HD footage of just the kind of sinking, you know, <laughs> before the battery cuts out, yeah. <laughs> and exactly. the SD card just destroys itself. So pretty much all. <laughs> DCL this year, what was you pretty much your highlight? And are you deaf from the yelling down the comms? You know, at the end of the races, some of the when the guys have won some of the races, I thought, nah, everybody that's listening is going to be now deaf. So how how is your hearing after all of that? And and definitely, what was your highlight for this year? Yeah, the, it's a good thing that Teamspeak has a uh, decibel roof feature. Otherwise, <laughs> they would be deaf for sure. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, I think the some of the highlights have been fighting in just it's just from each race some of the heats have been so immensely intense between different uh yeah it's just we've had so many heats and some of them have been so close and it's just been so exciting and me just sitting on the sidelines is almost even makes makes me more nervous than when i'm competing because it's kind of out of your control but you just really want them to to go well uh, and it's, it's yeah it's just the individual heats that we've had have been so good i think in some cases it's been really really fun to watch and i, I think the the larger tracks that they've had on this season has really lent itself to like develop its own story so it's been really fun 
and exciting to yeah, watch. And, and it's definitely been awesome to watch, you know, um, when Andreas beat Min Chan on, on, mm. on one of the heats and he just went off and then you could see him going into the next round and he was all pumped up and he was fighting it and I think he clipped one of the gates and he was just like, no! But yeah, it's been some epic racing this year. And I, it's I really don't think the guys awesome made it the guys made it fun as well i mean you know things like the gg sign and all that like it, yeah. there was little kind of thing that it was like yeah like this is cool they've really embraced it and i think i think it was it was it was good to see that yeah you yeah, know you can really see with andreas and jordy that they're they're, they're almost like half a generation younger than me so they've really grown up in the <laughs> live streaming yeah. world so they yeah they're they're, they're quite fun <laughs> meme supreme yeah exactly meme supreme yeah <laughs> cool um, we might get into some DCL community laps and yeah, see if we can about pick e your brain on. Yeah, we'll um, pick you, pick your brain on some of the guys that have chucked their laps up and see if we can um, get some pointers from yourself, Glenn. Yeah, sure. All right. So first up, we have got John uh, Giovanni Javat. I'm going to stuff that That'll right. John I'll stuff Bravo. that right up. John. That's the one. Thank you very much. I apologize in advance. Uh, it, he's a PC pilot for Team Squadron. He's um, Spanish. He's flying a t uh, Tango 2 Pro. Really? So on his PC. Yeah, yeah. I, I reached out to him and said, hey, dude, what are you rocking? And he was like, yeah, I'm running a Tango 2. So I'm like, nice. okay, cool. Yeah, a lot, I'm lot of explain his controllers. Yeah, they're, they're a nice little controller, I've got to admit. But his laps, from what I've seen, are really, really tight. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking uh, Are we looking at the Lax one now? Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I really think so as well. I, I think he, like the, the general lines are really good uh, from him here. Um, and it's, yeah, he's, and he's not losing too much speed in the corners. Um, Which is I, so important. It's the mm -hmm. hardest thing. Yeah, it's really easy to get bogged down with these uh, DCL quads, especially the the light one is a bit more forgiving, but the DCL 2019 quad that's in the game yeah. is uh, yeah. You really need to find the right lines, and I think um, what what I've been seeing a little bit as maybe something to consider is tr to always try to go tighter and look at the lines of, for example, Min Chan or especially Min Jae, he's really good at flying tight, mm -hmm. but also try to eliminate the the hunting because I've, re I've had some real issues with that as well. And I see some tendencies of this as well is when you're like wobbling a little bit from side to side or up or down, um, it usually makes it so that you start accelerating later off the corner and don't have as clean line out of a different a technical section and usually you lose more speed than you think that so trying to just turn and then lock to the next um, corner or the next gate is is a really good general tip for everyone uh, mm. and the way the way Taking i saw that micro adjustments out. exactly and the way i saw yeah. that it was just trying to be one step ahead just like when you're doing real racing um, is when you're passing the apex you should always be looking ahead and if you get that right and you're actually being more uh, proactive in the way you're flying you usually sort sort these type of like hunting uh, twitching movements out yeah exactly so you that usually sorts itself when you are a step ahead and you usually also fly a bit cleaner in, in at least in my experience that that's like something to to be uh, mindful if you want to reduce your lap time. Yeah, get into the flow state, I think. Mm. Exactly. Uh, and I think also, but just a big, big thing is just to analyze the fastest guy's laps and see what they're doing. It really makes a big difference. Speaking yeah, I think of, we'll um... discuss that one. It, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get There's there. been a lot of analyzing of uh, the next couple of pilots, that's for sure. Definitely from my point of view, and I think from Shane's point of view also. But yeah, yeah. I think you're definitely right with the... Um, yeah, the micro adjustments definitely take your times out. So, so but next definitely up, talking about the yeah. yeah. Next up, we got we got Finn. He's uh, he's a guy we've known him for a little while. He's a he's a PlayStation pilot. Um, yeah, Asylum. You uh, you sp spoke to him and asked him about what he was flying. Yeah, so he's he's obviously on his PS. Um, he's using a QX7 um, cool. for this. 
which actually works quite well. It's quite smooth. Um, he's part of Team Elite, and he's flying out of the UK, but his times are always been super fast and they're super smooth. I think they're always up there. Um, always in the, He's been in the top 10 since really the get-go, to be honest. Yeah, no, his lines are really good. I see that he's really good at pre-turning properly, like through mm. some of the S's and especially through the semi-dive gate cube thing. Mm. Um, he's been really doing that really tight, and which is impressive. Uh, I, I think there's not a lot of time to be made there, to be honest, for him. It's just trying to get some of these split S's more tight and consistent. That was one of the biggest issues I think all the pilots had when competing in DCL this year was getting the split S's correctly with not getting prop wash, but not getting uh, like getting it too far back so you lose time too wrong. Yeah. so yeah, yeah tight without prop wash but without crashing all the time it's really difficult with these quads i think that's the one of the big big difficult parts i think it's one thing especially the split s it's a maneuver that we do so much in freestyle it becomes second nature it's a very easy move in freestyle but as soon as you try and do it fast as you say prop yeah. wash suddenly it shows up all of the problems that you've got in your tune um, so yeah I, I, I think that's that's really interesting to hear you say that yeah and it, there, there's always these small tricks you can do is I think a lot of the split S's if you do try and do them straight over and then go under like a more traditional clean freestyle split S line you it's not as efficient especially not with these quads you need to try and carry momentum more so depending on the entry to the split S uh, you should try and just look at how the fastest guys do it they usually take it from an angle and split in so you so you don't so you mm. have both roll and pitch combined so i think that eliminates a little bit of the uh, prop wash that you get yeah it's it's a more flowy kind of line it's like hitting the apex of a corner versus kind of coming in and just kind of immediately turning yeah turning back out mm. yeah all right next up then yeah, uh, cool. lil lil lithium we have we have Lilithium, always um, super fast. Obviously, she's on her PS, um, Team Alpha Prop member, um, flying out of the USA. She's using her QX7 also, um, so there's a couple of QX7s in there. But Lil's always cranking out the hours, <laughs> always what cranking out the hours. She's super fast. Yeah, you can, yeah, she she's she has some serious speed as well. Um, I've seen some some of her freestyle posts on. Uh, yeah. The, in the community mm. is she a freestyle pilot foremost or more of a um, racer oh well, i think i and she probably correct me if i'm wrong but i think she came out of whoop racing to start with oh. um and then it's gone back into more freestyle stuff and then dcl came along and so she's jumped onto that yeah um, she, she mentioned the other day i think on the the drone is life podcast she was featured on that um obviously for her mm. work with uh, fly like a girl the the u.s sort of freestyle competition um, she was saying, I think DCL is the only place at the moment that she does race, um, yep. mainly because there's not a lot of events, I don't think, near her. But yeah, she's, I think, first and foremost, freestyler. Yeah, and, it, and you can really see that through her flying style. It's very smooth um, and not that many corrections, which I really like. It's it, it lends itself quite well to this type of racing, I think. So it's, yeah, she's, she's doing a great job. I think uh, she's flying quite tight as well. Uh, I think mm. it's through some corners, maybe trying to dare to do the more aggressive th throttle punch out of some uh, different sections. Um, otherwise, it's just that's looking fast. I think it's looking good. But yeah, no, I, I like this the smoothness. It's uh, it's a nice it's, it's nice, and I'm also impressed doing it on the PlayStation because the the latency is definitely higher as I've understood it flying on a PlayStation compared to a PC. And the frame so, rate's lower yeah. as well, which is yeah, exactly. really tough. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. A lot of a lot of guys from from the, the the PlayStation, the console community, were they were the guys really kind of pushing for the submission of laps, which was really interesting. I think it's it, I think mm. they're especially on the PlayStation. I know I know the guys are keen to sort of say, hey, look, we're just as good as we're some of the guys there. on the PC, you know. And and a lot of the guys do they transition to the PC and they're really up there in the leaderboard. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to see that, and it was it was quite cool to see that there was such a big con kind of console contingent came through with their laps. <laughs> yeah, but that's I, it. I, 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 I've 
always thought that, okay, the PC guys were that little bit quicker and whatever else. I didn't expect, when you start seeing some of their laps in comparison to the console, and then even with me, I'm still not even running, running a radio, for crying out loud. I'm still running my <laughs> PS controller. That's how, that's how shocking I still am, okay? But when you get everything dialed in, yeah, all right, stop rubbing it in, okay? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 fact that you can get a you can drop you know five almost ten seconds on some of your laps on, on console just by using a radio and then all of a sudden you step up your frame rates and you, and you jump over to the computer you know the times just keep tumbling even faster and faster and I'll, yeah there, there's going to have to be for some of those guys that really want to get serious they've got to they've got to step over and yeah. It does make a massive difference because you yeah. can actually see it. You can see the difference in both of those steps. So, yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, I think one of the biggest things as well when it comes to stepping over to a PC is that the latency becomes uh, and so because the frame rate also affects the latency and, mm. and the in, or the input lag basically. And I think it becomes it's getting towards the low latency you get when you're flying in real life. So you want to also if you also want to transition and get more practice that all. Um, help like better to the real world. Exactly. Yeah. That help better yeah. translation for that. Then you actually then it's better to go for the PC because you need to get get down to that low input lag that you can get from a real life drone. So that's that's also cool. a good thing to think about. So yeah, cool. Uh, we have got the number one ripper on the PlayStation. Uh, <laughs> Zish and Ibrahim. Zish O2. He has been an absolute force all season on the PS. Um, he's the owner and manager of Team Elite, um, coming out of the UK. He's running X9D um, for his, and he has he has <laughs> been the yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Just because you got two of them sitting there, I reckon. Um, <laughs> he he's been the gold standard almost all year for the PlayStation, and yeah, I, th I think if he doesn't jump over to console uh, over to computer soon for next year um i think yeah he's definitely a contender he's definitely a contender some of his times even on console have been up there against some of the pro pilots on I, a I try basis. and i try and, and, and let him know crazy. how he's getting on like i i i fly pc for solos every week so i kind of mm. keep track of the leaderboards and i, I try and sort of like I, I, I don't know, it's interesting to see where Zeech places, especially, as you say, given the input lag, given the, the latency and the, the frames per second that he's dealing with, it's mm. interesting to see how well Zeech is doing on a PlayStation. It's crazy, the, the, the amount, the, how, like, or it's how tight he can actually fly with the, that type mm. of latency mm. really speaks to uh, how good he is. He seems to have some incredible catch reflexes, so I'm... <laughs> It, the the flying is really impressive. It I think from the videos we we have here today, this is the second most impressive flying. I think he'd definitely be really competitive if he went to PC, and I think think that's a big um, I, I, yeah a recommendation if you want to get on a DCL team, you need to get a PC because you'll be competing there, and uh, then you can start comparing yourself against some of the pilots who are on DCL teams as well. And I think I think uh, the flying that that we see here is definitely uh, yeah you could be picked up by by a team if you uh, put in the time I think and uh, and show yourself uh, fast during the tryouts for next year. Undoubtedly, this is some really impressive flying. I really like it. Yeah, and uh, I think that was we're the call for that for sure for the drafts next year. I oh think yeah, definitely. It's, it's gonna be it's gonna be incredible, especially with all the the esports stuff that we've had on this year. And the new audience that that are coming through, I think it's going to be a huge, a huge kind of, a huge ask for for every team to sit there and evaluate the the times that are going to be submitted. Is yeah, it's it's going to be a good one. Yeah, and I think, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that I, from the when the first draft came out and, and we all sat down and did our drafts on their console and whatever else, and, and DCL were like, oh, we'll take people from you know console also and and evaluate them and put them into the team. There was. There was a period there, I think, that a lot of the guys were like, especially with the way 2020 has played out, with teams having their own roster, and then all of a sudden, okay, we've got our own rostered pilots. How do we try and incorporate new guys? How do we keep the guys on the team already flying? And then DCL had already made this kind of 
commitment to, t to people when they put the game out that they could potentially be in this draft and be flying, you know, for a team. I, I couldn't quite understand it at the time. I thought they were kind of poo-hooing, you know, or letting us go or, or false advertising almost to a certain degree about their commitment to it. But in hindsight, I can understand now that, okay, you've got all these guys already on roster. We've got to keep them active and whatever else. But then there was the second thought that kind of came out of a lot of the console guys, which was, oh, they're just let, they're this, you know, almost cash cowing us, whatever else, because they're not, they're only worrying about the guys on PC doing fast times. But again, in um, hindsight, you can see the difference. You can see the difference in times, in latency, in performance between a console and that. And so when you see a guy like Zish, who's still killing it in these times, I think that, you know, if that, if somehow the DCL and the teams can translate that into a, a, a PC time or still see the, the skill and the and the level of commitment that some of these guys are performing with technically you could say a substandard platform to a certain degree um the these guys there's got to be a way of somehow integrating them into the to the main show really because there's so there's some awesome guys out there that are killing it um, yeah for, for sure and they've got it's got some genuine skills um so it has been interesting i think this year the way that the draft and the dcl handed all that and, and i i understand it now um, and i think a lot of the guys do understand it and how it all played out but yeah there, there's definitely some guys with some serious skills out there it's like um squid fpv we're about to play like Stuart francis he's he's actually on pc and you can tell the difference between zish who's number one console or playstation at least anyway not the xbox and then you drop into Stuart's lap. This is just crazy quick. This is just crazy quick, and it is crazy smooth, especially through the gnarly. Uh, I'm just like Glenn's smiling. You got to be he's, kidding he's, me! I can see he's impressed. Oh, yeah. I know. It's just, it's just so smooth. It's so snappy, and and there's just no way you're going to get that out of a console. And then you combine it with a guy that's got talent. Um, yeah, and and that's how you get the big show. Yeah. I I think one of the big things that you can really see when uh, Squid's flying here is the way he's able to carry momentum through the gates. Mm. It, it, it looks like he's pushing the quad forward more than the, than it can do compared to when you're playing on PlayStation. I think that's it's those small nuances, the way you can carry speed through corners, but even but also taking it tight. I think that's the key to going fast, but also why it's so much more difficult to fly when you have more latency. It's because it's hard to find those small extra nuances, um, especially when you're competing against other people who have it more easy. So, <laughs> Yeah, and the reflexes as well. I mean, I, I'm, I'm watching the, the oil bando track, for example, that bit, you, you kind of loop over the top of that ducting and then you're over and under the pipes. My brain couldn't mm. keep up with this. I remember the first time I watched it, I just thought it was because it was early in the morning and I hadn't had my coffee. I'm, I watch it back now. I'm like, I oh God, my brain just can't process all this information that fast. It, how much of it is just muscle memory? It's a lot, lot of muscle memory. I think um, this has to be. For, uh, I think it's muscle memory combined with cat reflexes and the grind. It's, yeah, for grind. grind. Yeah. No, it's it, it's but, these are some seriously impressive laps. I, I'd be surprised if if Squid isn't picked up by a team next year. You could see that he, he has some time to Minjay on the uh, yeah the, the, the gnarly track. But Minjay is, I'd say, when it comes to if Minjay grinds as much as the other guys, he's probably one of the absolute fastest guys out there. He's just absolutely incredible on finding some laps. And so, I, I know, I know, Squid was really yeah. excited to to show the the gnarly track because I I think he beat Andreas on that, so he was uh, yeah. he was yeah, he was keen to that. do that before he uploaded it. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, he, he wanted to say. show off. And, <laughs> but um, yeah, he's he's using a T sixteen S actually on this oh, one. Jumper. Um, he's just using the jumper, yeah. Yeah. So he I, loves it. He thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread, and he he, work, he said it works really well on the sim. So he flies it real life and whatever else and goes it's never out of his hands mm, yeah i'm considering maybe getting a, a radio mm. master because my uh tyrannis is well it, it's as old as my 
uh, exploration into this hobby, basically. So it's <laughs> it, it's getting on to the years. So it's yeah, it's missing some buttons and uh, so on. So I might be getting a Radio Master and, and pairing it with either the uh, TBS system or the Immersion RC Ghost. I think it's leaning towards the Ghost system for my personal Ghost rig. Ghost looks interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm I'm gonna delve more into the difficult technical details, but it's good. It's fun seeing some 2.4 gigahertz um, mm. competition when it comes to racing uh, spec sure. stuff. Cool. Um, all right. We got anything else we want to discuss or look over before we round it up? Or oh, we can round it up. I don't mind. <laughs> we'll let you get on with sleeping. What's it like? Nine o'clock there now? Ten past nine. Um, yeah, it's not. It's not the. This what, week. Yeah, it's uh, definitely been a bumper show. Um, yeah, it's not the it's not the late night for me. It's the early morning that's going to kill me. I'm going to be up at one fifty. I've got to be up in the morning. One fifty. I've got a two thirty start. So it's going to be nuts. Mm. Anyway, all right. Um, we'll wrap this up. Um, so massive thanks to you, Glenn, um, being yeah, our first official guest on the show. Thanks for your insights and your input. That's been absolutely fantastic. Make sure you check out. Glenn's YouTube channel and all of Glenn's socials um, so you can see what he's up to and what he's changing that's it um, keep an eye out on the our Apex community web chat channel uh, next month we might have a bit of a festive thing going on coming as we lead into the festive season so <laughs> keep an eye out on that thanks for everybody for uploading yeah <laughs> I'll send you one just so I can get you out of that ethics hat seriously <laughs> It's going to be the one thing I do this year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to everybody for uploading their videos. Um, it's been awesome. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for Glenn for, for checking them out. Um, make sure you keep uploading all your FPV related vids, questions, and thanks for supporting the channel. Um, yeah, so until next time, I think we'll wrap it up. So fly safe. Fly fast. Fly Apex. Fly Apex. See you guys. Awesome. See you guys.